Yeah, so let's just start off. If you can introduce yourself, tell me your name and a little bit about your background. All right. Uh, so I'm Devin Akin. I'm a PhD candidate uh, here at the University of Calgary in Canada, Alberta. Uh, my research is into high speed CMOS image sensor, er, high speed CMOS image sensors um, that originally started out using a lot of uh, the Cadence software suite. So all of the like, really expensive uh, bits of software. But uh, in the end, I, I sort of made the move over to using open source stuff for my research uh, after dealing with uh, a lot of software licensing issues and a lot of uh, tools that should exist that didn't. And so that kind of changed the direction of my research and how things ended up uh, ended up going for my, uh, for my PhD here. Um, I'll probably be graduating sometime Sometime early summer next uh, next year. So. Cool. Good luck. Thank um, you. I'll need it. <laughs> what? What? Why did so? You were one of the people who helped me uh, beta test the zero to ASIC analog course. So, can you tell us why you wanted to take the course? Um, because the existing like the tools are not friendly, and the closed source tools are not any friendlier than the open source tools. But at least I had someone when I learned those those closed source tools to essentially guide me through the process. And really, the biggest thing, both for myself and when I've taught students, is once you've gotten through at least one design with the with the tool chain, it becomes just way easier to actually go build on your design flow, change things as needed. But that first that first bit of the learning curve is really difficult to get through. And I've known. A lot of grad students um, from before I discovered Tiny Tape Out existed, who they tried to use magic. They tried to use uh, use uh, X scheme and use the open source tool chains for a lot of things, uh, especially because uh, University of Calgary has tried to have a big entrepreneurial push, and so we've had a lot of people who've gone, "Hey, let's let's use the open source so we don't have to drop like the best rate I've heard for Cadence with the uh, with the." Uh, like startup rate was fifty grand for a completely uh, bare bones licensing setup, and uh, but no one was ever able to actually get into the open source tools uh, because the guides didn't exist. That's uh, because there wasn't a there wasn't a good way to get over that initial learning curve, uh, so that you can start building some real real workflows. So you wanted to like. Uh kick like jump over the hard part absolutely absolutely uh, going through the course uh i'd say it saved me at least six months um because the number of the number of stumbling blocks that there are in just learning the workflow there are mm. a lot of uh, a lot of them require you to in order to know what to look for you have to already know the thing that you are trying to figure out at that point, and so, really, without without someone to hold your hand through the beginning parts of it, uh, at least with the way the tools are now, um, there's really no way to get into it. Yeah. So, is that one of the questions I ask? Is like, what's the most valuable part? So, saving six months sounds pretty valuable. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the the massive time savings of going through the course. Uh, 100% worth it on that, just that alone. Um, also, I'm kind of, I've kind of grown of the opinion, and I've argued this with a couple of my peers. Of, I see the open source tool chain right now is sort of like how KiCad was 10 years ago for PCB design. Yeah, and, and so, yeah, now everyone kind of expects, hey, you know how to use KiCad if you're going to do some board designs. Like, yeah, you might use Altium, but most of the time, KiCad's good enough, and so you don't pay for the license on that. that. What part of the course did you enjoy the most? Um, doing the layout. Um, and this, this, this was the same for when I learned, uh, when I learned Cadence, uh, but I just really enjoy doing layout. Layout is just hmm. a super relaxing part of chip design as a well. whole. Um, just the the challenge of trying to fit everything into the small as small an area as possible without causing other problems. Um, I'm used to in uh, my other designs I've done. Uh, so in image sensors, everything is about fitting 
something that is normally, you know, 100 micrometers by 100 micrometers into 10 micrometers by 10 micrometers. And so those challenges are like a large part of the challenge is how do you lay that out in a way that gives you reasonable performance and doesn't have everything interfere with one another. Hmm. Or, or, um, yeah, with with image sensors specifically, um, so you end up uh, uh, if I say, "Hey, design a one mega sample ADC," that's not a real big challenge. If I tell you, "Hey, that ADC has to be no more than one micrometer across," that that becomes a pretty big challenge. And yeah. you, even in the older processes, you're looking at you know ten micrometers, but then by three hundred micrometers, and so you, these weird aspect ratios are always a, del- a delightful challenge when it comes to uh, to chip design like chip design sudoku yeah exactly exactly almost tetris yeah yeah that's better actually chip design tetris so are you planning to uh now use this with your teaching and your work in the university oh yeah um so uh right uh right as uh, as covid went through and i was doing like getting getting stuff prepared for students and putting stuff online. I did a series of labs that worked students through using Cadence uh, from schematics all the way to um, uh, post layout simulations with Monte Carlo and all that. Um, I wrote a I wrote a paper on that, and right now what I'm doing is I'm trying to get some of the uh, of the students in the FPGA course, which is the third year course to decide to take on chip design challenges as their um, their third year design course project where they get a lot of freedom there uh, mm-hmm. and trying to sort of guide them through towards, hey, you know, put your design on tiny tape out because, well, you actually can put your design on tiny tape out, whereas it, with the more traditional routes with CMC, you need to be you know, academically interesting, <laughs> and whereas tiny tape out, you can just be interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, would you recommend this course to other people? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and I've I already have. I've uh, I've talked to it. Uh, I've talked about it to multiple other graduate students, as well as a couple of friends in industry who, like, they're wanting to get more into uh, into doing stuff outside of you know work where you know mm. they don't have as much freedom to experiment there. Um, yeah. That was always a surprise to me, like meeting people who come on the digital course and they're already involved in um, the industry, but realizing that they're not allowed to use the tools outside of the office and in the office they can only work on the thing their boss tells them to do. So they don't get to try their own ideas. Yeah. um, uh, Like even in the cases where they have got, where they do get to try it, because I know one buddy of mine, he... Uh, he said, like he stayed at work just to build a build an op amp. I think he was working in seven nanometer at the time, hmm. and he just wanted to see if he if he could, uh, like what sort of performance specs he could get. He spent an evening on that, but it's not like he ever gets to man- he he won't get to manufacture that because hmm. you're not going to throw you know <laughs> several million dollars at some <laughs> some some. Oh, I just did this for the, for the fun of it. Uh, no, it's got to be it's got to be really practical. It's got to be saleable. Uh, it's like you have to have a pretty good degree of confidence that it's going to work off the bat. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, the, the allure of going to like, hey, let's let's use an older process. Let's use the use the tools that don't cost more than more than a house. Um, uh, it's it, it's alluring to those who you know you get into it for the joy of design, and then you're stuck doing the same design over and over again. Yeah, that kind of deep specialization that you tend to see. Yeah. Um, yeah, so do you, uh, do you have your design handy? Do you want to share what you taped out? My analog design was a couple of ring oscillators with a bunch of filtering on the output in order to take that square wave and give me a sine wave. Uh, I did what I could to get the, the frequencies to be close to 20 and 21 megahertz. Um, which is a surprisingly annoying challenge to get things to oscillate at close to the same frequency without them oscillating at the same frequency. Mm. Um, And it was a way to correct for one of my first chip designs that I ever did um, and just move it from 
AMS 350 nanometer where it was, and it had a lot of issues on that design uh, to the Sky 130 where hopefully it won't have the same issues. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the the in my in my early days, um, and this is another one of the big advantages of uh, of the course existing and why I, I push grad students towards it is uh, nobody taught me how to do post layout simulations until a week before my first tape out. Um, oh, wow. Um, and so that design uh, had a lot of coupling issues with it. Uh, hmm. We did get some results out, but uh, none of them were as good as they could have been because, well, yeah, the tools all exist in Cadence, and yeah, they're more advanced than the uh, than the open source tools, uh, but nobody knows how to use them <laughs> in grad school um, because what happens is one person one person knows all the tools and then they train the next grad student and they forget a couple that they don't use for their design. Then they train the next and they forget a couple. Um, and yeah, I was the first grad student in my lab for several, several years who did any substantial post layout simulations. Like the previous grad student did a few, but they never did their full design together mm. They're in post layout and they never did, um, large sub assemblies in post layout. Um, or even corner simulations. And so they got lucky that all their designs worked correctly. Uh, I didn't. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a recreation of a bit that didn't work in an earlier chip. That's good to know. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, do you have anything, any last words, any uh, last thoughts you want to share? Um, when are you coming out with a textbook? <laughs> Never. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not joking. Like the number of professors who would uh, who would love to have that for their courses, um, because, well, you talk to the professorship. None of them have time to go and write uh, write lab manuals and all that. Mm. Uh, and they go, well, you know, it'd be great to be great to teach these undergrads. Oh, this uh, that this about chip design or that about chip design. Um, but uh, they don't have the time or, in some cases, the experience with the tools yeah. uh, to really go through and design it. So, you know, I really, I, I well, hope let, you let change me know your if mind you want to, uh, If you want to write the book and we co-author it. Let there me we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, already trying to do that with another pro with another professor here uh, for uh, mm. for some design design work that needs a needs a textbook associated with it. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, thanks very much for sharing your thoughts, Devin, yeah. and uh, good luck with the future tape outs. Yeah. Thank you. I'll need it. <laughs>